The World Health Organization announced that due to the lack of security guarantees, it has had to suspend four humanitarian missions to northern Gaza. Brazil commemorates on Monday the first year of the coup attempt promoted by the far right. And in China, the government reported that the Secret Intelligence Service of the United Kingdom has been spying in the country since 2015. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Resul Studios in Havana, Cuba. We we'll begin with the news. The World Health Organization announced that due to the lack of security guarantees, it has had to suspend four humanitarian missions to northern Gaza. After confirming a new cancellation, the agency detailed that since December 26, they have not received guarantees of elimination of security conflicts. The, the mission that was intended to deliver medical supplies for emergency operations for patients in five hospitals in that area of the enclave continues to await secure authorizations. They also warned that these medical supplies are the only alternative for hundreds of patients who are dying as a consequence of the genocidal operation carried out by IFRO in the enclave. On Sunday, the staff from the World Health Organization and the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs visited Al Aqsa Martyrs Hospital, the main hospital in central Gaza. The UN staff reported that medics, patients, and displaced people are fleeing from the hospital as the Israeli population draws closer. Losing the facility would be another major blow to a health system shattered by three months of constant bombings. Doctors Without Borders and other aid groups withdrew from the hospital in Deir al Bala in recent days, saying it is too dangerous. According to the UN Humanitarian Office, only 13 of Gaza's 36 hospitals are even partially functioning. The health minister said early Monday that 73 bodies and 99 wounded people were brought to the hospital in just the last 24 hours. I'm in Al-Aqsa Hospital in the middle area of Gaza, the middle part of the Gaza Strip, in the emergency department where they're treating children, several children on the floor and on a gurney behind me, doctors calling out for scalpel and chest tubes, um, many people coming in from an explosion. There's one child who unfortunately passed away whose body is not identified, um, and it's, as you can see, a chaotic scene. Uh, unfortunately, this area uh, is close to an area that was uh, evacuated yesterday. An evacuation order was issued, and um, they've lost a lot of their staff. Uh, this hospital is currently operating with about 30% of the staff that it had just a few days ago. Um, they are seeing, in some cases, hundreds of casualties every day in a small emergency department. Uh, yesterday they said they had one doctor working overnight in this emergency department with hundreds, in some cases, of casualties coming in on a daily basis. On Monday, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that his government is facing a plague of leaks. In this sense, Netanyahu proposed that ministers who attend security meetings or receive briefings take a lie detector test. In this turn, Israeli media reported clashes between ministers and military officials during a cabinet meeting last week over the post-Hamas era in Gaza following the ongoing Israeli war. Israeli occupational forces, air and ground attacks on Gaza since October 7th have killed at least 22,835 Palestinians and wounded 58,416. For his part, Israeli Prime Minister assured that his government will push for a law requiring all persons participating in cabinet and security discussions, including political and professional ranks to undergo a lie detector test. The Israeli government approved the creation of two new settlements in East Jerusalem to make way for the construction of Silicon Valley. Lawyer Mohanad Habara said that this project is an attack on business owners in the industrial zone and restricts Palestinian housing plans. Habara asserted that the Israeli authorities have presented this settlement as a new neighborhood and ignored the existing presence of the Arab neighborhood. In this context, the Israeli municipality, which initiated the plan in 2012, has already demolished some 70 residential and commercial buildings to carry out the project.
In Iraq, the Iraqi resistance confirmed drone strikes against Israeli and U.S. bases as part of offensive in support of Palestine. According to a statement issued by the Iraqi resistance, the drone strikes targeted an Israeli army military base in the occupied Syrian Golan Heights and another U.S. base located north of the Syrian city of al Hasaka. They also reportedly launched several attacks against Israeli strategic targets, including the port of Heilat in the southern occupied Palestinian territories and the Karish gas field in the Mediterranean. The Iraqi resistance reiterated that this offensive was in response to the killing of civilians by Israel in the Gaza Strip and vowed to continue the offensive until the campaign of aggression ceased. The Iraqi resistance, which groups several anti-terrorist organizations, shelled with more than 30 missiles the illegal U.S. military base in northern Syria. After the series of terrorist attacks that took the life of several leaders in Syria, Lebanon and Iraq, groups loyal to the Palestinian cause announced a counteroffensive. The U.S. and Israeli governments confirmed that they were responsible for the executions. For this reason, the resistance bombed the al Qaim al bukam al Pass and also the Ain al-Assad airbase. The resistance groups, joined by Yemen, affirmed that this is a response to Washington's complicity in the genocide against the people in Gaza. Pope Francis condemns the immense tragedy and useless slaughter of civilians in conflicts such as in Gaza and says those killed should not be considered collateral damage in his New Year's address to diplomats at the Vatican. Perhaps we need to realize more clearly that civilian victims are not collateral damage, that men and women with names and surnames who lose their lives, they are children who are orphaned and deprived of their future. They are individuals who suffer from hunger, thirst, and cold, or are mutilated as a result of the power of modern explosives. If we were able to look each of them in the eye, call them by the name, and learn something of their personal story, we would see war for what it is, nothing other than immense strategy and useless slaughter, one that defends the dignity of every person on this earth. Let's take a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back from the South. Brazil's National Congress has served as a canvas for an imposing celebration of democracy, a preview of the events that on Monday commemorate the first year of the coup attempt promoted by the far right. After a call made on Sunday by President Lula Silva, the phrase democracy unite us was projected over the Congress building. At 9.30 p.m. local time, the intervention began with the colors of the national flag under the slogan Reaffirmation of Democracy. More than 500 guests will gather on Monday in the Planet of the Ministries in Brasilia, the capital of the country, to commemorate the most brutal attack on democracy promoted by the former president of the far right, Jair Bolsonaro. In Ecuador, President Daniel Loboa called an emergency meeting of his security cabinet on Sunday following the escape of the country's most dangerous drug trafficker and threat from criminal groups against the executive. The meeting, which was announced by Roberto Isurieta, Secretary General of Communications of the Presidency, would have been aimed at making decisions. The National Prosecutor's Office has reportedly launched an investigation into the escape of Jose Adolfo Macias, known as Fito, leader of the bloody gang known as Los Choneros. Previously and after announcements of exchanges in security matters, a criminal organization broadcast a video warning the president that Ecuador was not El Salvador. The agreements of the security conclave were not informed to the country. We have finished the meeting with the Council of Public Security of the State with the presence of the President of the Republic, all the elements and all the representatives of the Ecuadorian State on behalf of the President. First of all, we want to thank the courage and commitment for all the forces of order, armed forces and police that in operation that we include more than 3,000 people have entered the prison in search of the most wanted prisoners. The operation continues. 
Cesar Zapata, commander of the National Police, without even daring to mention the name of Jose Adolfo Macias Salazar, known as Vito, reported on the operation carried out to verify the escape, although not to expedite his capture. The police carried out an intervention in the social rehabilitation center in Guayaquil. They managed to seize several items such as silver phones, sockets, plugs, white frames and other items that were found. I must also mention that they were, were able to detect the absence of one of the inmates who remained in the social rehabilitation center. National police together with the armed force continue to investigate but for that I must emphasize that we have the support of the national government, the support of the Minister of the Interior and also in this case the persecution has already added. The United Nations described as alarming the food situation in Haiti, where over 8.2 million people have difficulty accessing basic products. According to World Food Program, the high levels of food insecurity are the result of gang violence and the economic slowdown. The UN agency warned that although the basic food basket is available throughout the country, many Haitians are unable to buy due to rising food prices. On top of this situation, heavy rains damaged large areas of farmland, affecting the agricultural yields of the Caribbean country. The World Food Program warned that without an immediate influx of funds, there is a risk that even more people will go hungry. In the United States, congressional leadership reached an agreement that could avoid a government shutdown in 2024. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mike Johnson, they announced they have reached an agreement that includes spending $1.66 trillion to fund the federal government through 2024. The measure must now be discussed by the lower house where strong opposition from the ultra-conservative wing of the Republican Party is expected. The U.S. media projected a new government shutdown after January 20th due to disagreements between the parties to approve the temporary funding bill. In Germany, farmers took to the streets staging blockades with their tractors to protest against Berlin's plans to cut tax breaks for agriculture and end subsidies for agricultural diesel. The coordinated nationwide demonstration targeted motorway access ramps in particular, snarling traffic and followed a smaller demonstration in Berlin last month. Furious farmers kicked off a series of crippling strikes sinking the country deeper into a winter of discontent. In Berlin, dozens of tractors and lorries stationed in the city's center blasted their horns to signal their anger at the start of a planned week of action. Road workers will likewise launch a three-day strike on Wednesday, with unions seeking a pay rise to compensate for months of painfully high inflation. Workers in sectors across Germany, from metallurgy and transport to education, have turned to industrial action in recent weeks. We have a second short break coming up, but before we invite you to join our WhatsApp community for our English-speaking audience, you can scan the QR code on screen to join directly and share the link to reach more people. Constant news coverage of Latin America and the Caribbean as well as the rest of the world. Stay connected and informed with Telesur. Final short break, don't go away. Welcome back from the south. In Libya, the L Libyan National Oil Corporation announced a complete shutdown of its operations in the Sharara field due to a labor strike. This field, the largest and most important in the country, has been completely blockaded by its workers who demand better services and sufficient fuel supplies in the region of Fersan, southwest Libya. With a daily production of more than 240,000 barrels of oil, the protest action puts the country's industry and economy on edge. The workers claim that in addition to the adverse conditions of the population of Fezzan, an oil-rich province has offered a serious deterioration following the assassination of leader Muammar Gaddafi. Niger's military junta, known as the National Council for the Safeguarding of the Homeland, admitted on Monday to killing civilians in response to an alleged terrorist attack. The Nigerian Defense and Security Forces stated that it was a joint operation with Burkina Faso to prevent a terrorist attack on a military position close to the border between the two countries. The government expressed its condolences to the families of the civilians killed and wished a speedy recovery to the wounded. In this sense, they also reaffirmed their commitment to ensure the protection of people and their property throughout the territory and urged the population to be more vigilant and to collaborate with the security forces. So far, the authorities have not provided specific details on the number of casualties. 
On Monday, the Chinese government reported that the Secret Intelligence Service of the United Kingdom has been spying in the country since 2015. In turn, Chinese authorities point out that a person linked to the facts is in custody. According to the report presented by the Ministry of Security, the MI6 employed a person whose nationality was not outlined to carry out several missions. The person collected more than 14 pieces of classified information and said at least three intelligence reports. The spy identified in the report as Wang also tried to recruit for the British mission. Meanwhile, Beijing has urged London to properly handle their differences and respect each other's interests. Local media in Pakistan reported on Monday that a bomb killed five police guarding anti-police vaccination campaign. In turn, officials said a roadside bomb struck a Pakistani police truck carrying about 25 policemen assigned to a polio vaccination campaign in northwestern Pakistan. The attack, which resulted in five deaths, occurred in Mamun, Bahu district bordering Afghanistan. Anwar ul a senior government official in Bahu district, assumed that the attack was carried out by the Taliban group. In Japan, authorities confirmed on Monday that the death toll from the earthquake that struck Western Japan on January 1st rose to 161. In this sense, the statement of the government of the central region of Ishikawa, where the epicenter of the 7.5 mile quake was located, added that the number of missing persons was 103. It is worth noting that the areas affected by the earthquake have been facing snowfall for the past two days, which has further complicated rescue operations. Meanwhile, thousands of rescuers from all over Japan have arrived to help those affected despite the difficulties caused by road closures and some 1,000 landslides. On Monday in France, locals and visitors continue to face freezing temperatures that are forecast to remain below zero degrees Celsius in the north while flooding in other areas persists. According to Metro France, the departments of Nord and Pas de Calais remain on urge alert for flooding due to the effect of El Nino, which exposes European communities to devastating flooding. While climate change brought some of the warmest months on record to France, it does not mean winter has disappeared. According to the Weather Service, more than half of the departments are under snow and ice alert due to colder masses from Scandinavia, where record temperatures of up to minus 43 degrees Celsius were recorded in northern Sweden on Thursday. Visitors in France talk about how the current ecological crisis is making winter in some areas not what it used to be. I honestly like it. I, I'm, I'm a person that has lived his entire life in a, in a tropical weather, always warm. So coming to Europe and, uh, and experiencing the cold, experiencing some, a little bit of snow, um, it's, it's quite fun. It's a, it's a, it's a dream, actually. But um, unfortunately, because of the climate change, you don't see a lot, of, uh, a lot of snow now. Paraguay is on alert due to a heat wave with temperatures that could exceed 40 degrees Celsius in this country. The Meteorology and Hydrology Department detailed that the extreme heat is threatening the Paraguayan Chaco and other departments of the western region, so it is expected that the eastern region would also be affected. On the other hand, specialists expect temperatures to drop as of Thursday due to the heavy rains that will be developing since Wednesday, accompanied by thunderstorms, while indicating that the average annual temperatures are expected to average 20 degrees Celsius due to the proximity to the tropics and are expected to increase due to the global climate crisis that exists. Like this, we have come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at tresorenglish.net. You can also join us on our social media on Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Tresor English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.